Welcome to Diplomacy, Strategy, and Force, Managing Rising Tensions in Taiwan. This webinar is being co-hosted by the US Asia Law Institute and the Reese Center on Law and Security, both at the NYU School of Law. And I am Executive Director of the US Asia Law Institute, Catherine Wilhelm. I have just one housekeeping announcement to make. Uh, this event has been approved for one credit hour in the areas of professional practice for New York State CLE credit. At a certain point in the program, we will pause to display and read aloud a CLE course code. Those who are seeking CLE credit will need to record this code and submit it at, on an attorney affirmation form, which will be sent to you after the event has concluded if you registered or indicated that you were um, seeking CLE credit. This event is appropriate for both newly admitted and experienced attorneys. And now I'm going to hand the mic over to Jerry Cohen, the founder and director emeritus of the US Asia Law Institute and our moderator tonight. Thank Great. you very much, uh, Catherine. No subject could be more important than the one we're going to be talking about tonight. Every event of the last few weeks has demonstrated the crucial relevance of Taiwan and its future, not only to US-China relations and to Taiwan's future, but to world peace generally. There is a widespread fear that the two major powers or the government in Taiwan may mismanage things. And if so, whether by intention or unintentional action, uh, we would lead to a very serious conflict. Uh, Australia is very much upset about this. So is Japan and other countries are increasingly concerned. So we're very lucky tonight to have four experts to talk with us about this subject. They are all experienced, they have diverse backgrounds. And rather than ask each to make a statement initially, we're gonna start cutting to the chase by having a dialogue. And I'll introduce each speaker and then ask initial questions and our discussion will be launched. Uh, the first speaker, and we list them alphabetically, uh, is uh, really Tess Bridgman of the Reese Center on Law and Security. She's a legal specialist and you'll see the relevance of that in due course. Our second speaker is Bonnie Glazer who's the director of the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund in the United States, and one of the country's leading analysts of international affairs in Asia. Our third speaker is Dean Vincent Wang Wei Chung. Uh, he's a professor of political science, as well as Dean at the Delphi College and extremely knowledgeable about Taiwan and its internal situation. And our fourth speaker, alphabetically, Stephen Young, is a former director of the American Institute in Taiwan, our functional substitute for an embassy, and he's former consul general of the United States in Hong Kong. So each of these people has got a lot to say and I look forward to the discussion. So Bonnie, I'll start with you and if you could tell us uh, how should we understand the situation that in the Taiwan Strait? Uh, what does history tell us? What do we know about Beijing's increasing power and increasing appetite for Taiwan? Uh, What's going to happen to cross great relations in your view? And you've been following this a long time. Well, it's such a privilege uh, to be here with you, uh, Jerry, and be on the, on, on the same virtual stage uh, with these other uh, terrific experts, uh, at least two of whom I've known for many, many years. 
Taiwan has captured the attention, I think, of the entire world and, and your very solemn remarks at the opening, I think were very appropriate. This is really the only issue I think that the US and China could go to war over. Um, and, and as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, it in fact occupied quite a bit of time uh, during uh, the just completed uh, meeting uh, or virtual summit between uh, President Biden and, and Xi Jinping. But uh, to put, situate this a bit in, in history, uh, of course, everybody knows that in 1949, the Chinese communists defeated the nationalists. The nationalists retreated to the island of Taiwan. And uh, then in the, it, in the late 50s, um, during what came to be known as the second Taiwan Strait crisis, we even had the Chinese military firing artillery at the islands uh, off the coast of mainland China, Jinmen and Mazu. Uh, and uh, that conflict uh, ended, but the Chinese nevertheless continued shelling the island on alternate days. That finally stopped in 1979 when the United States normalized ties uh, with the People's Republic of China and broke ties uh, with Taiwan. Uh, but, you know, China has never stopped pressuring Taiwan. And as its coercive toolbox uh, has expanded and China's overall power has grown, it has become bolder and bolder um, in its use of diplomatic and military and economic uh, uh, coercive tools, uh, also including cyber and disinformation. And since uh, Tsai Ing-wen was elected president in 2016, Beijing has really doubled down on its coercive uh, tactics uh, against, uh, against Taiwan. Now, from China's perspective, of course, uh, Taiwan is really not a military problem. It is a political problem. This is, again, an unfinished civil war. And Beijing's immediate goal is to prevent Taiwan independence, but its long-term goal is to achieve reunification. Xi Jinping has said that uh, reunification is a requirement for the achievement of his Chinese dream of national rejuvenation, for which he has set a target of uh, the year 2049. So China, I think, hopes to achieve that goal through undermining the confidence of the Taiwanese people in their government, inducing psychological despair, along with a sense of inevitability that Taiwan's future only lies uh, with China. Public opinion polls in Taiwan suggest that China's strategy is not working. Only a small percentage of the people in Taiwan favor unification now or in the future. Most of the people uh, say that they would like to preserve the status quo, um, in part because they know that supporting independence would likely lead to Chinese use of force uh, against Taiwan. But nevertheless, there is a growing percentage of people who do support independence, um, either immediately uh, or in the future. So there are different views among observers of cross-strait relations about Xi Jinping's intentions and his strategy toward Taiwan. And one view holds that um, the development of Chinese military capabilities to seize and control uh, Taiwan um, has basically meant that the PLA will in fact use military force to reunify with uh, Taiwan. Perhaps by the end of this decade, we had the uh, former indo pakon commander, uh, Phil Davidson tell Congress earlier this year that China will invade Taiwan within six years. Uh, the PLA can inflict a heavy cost on intervening U.S. military assets. It does have uh, a significant conventional advantage, uh, in fact, in part because Taiwan, of course, is situated so close to China geographically. And so the argument goes China will want to take advantage of this window of opportunity, which it might lose in the 1930s. So the danger of a military strike is real and it should not be ruled out. But the other view, uh, and I would identify myself with this latter view, is that Beijing really wants to unify the country without bloodshed, that Xi Jinping does not want a war with the United States. He doesn't want to start a conflict he might lose. Um, he could run the risk of pushing other countries into an anti-China coalition. Um, and he could put in jeopardy his articulated goal of national rejuvenation. Uh, so Xi Jinping has really only given one speech, a comprehensive speech on Taiwan. It was in January 2019. And he made a few other short statements about Taiwan at other times, 
um, and when they, they mark the 100th anniversary in, in the summer of the founding of the CCP, for example, he gave another speech in the fall on the 110th anniversary of the Nationalist Revolution. But essentially, he continues to say that he supports uh, peaceful reunification, but he doesn't rule out use of force. And he inherited from Hu Jintao a policy of peaceful development across the strait. That's the policy guideline um, that he inherited. And he's never rejected it. So essentially, when Xi Jinping met with President Biden just a few days ago, um, you know, he said the same thing. He'd like to achieve reunification peacefully, but that if uh, Taiwan were to push for independence, that uh, the uh, Chinese China would take uh, decisive uh, measures, and, and so that that really is is the position that that China has held uh, for a long time. I don't think its position today is really very different than it was uh, under under prior leaders. Xi Jinping has said a few things that are unique, like the differences between the two sides of the strait should be passed down from generation to generation. Um, my view is that that signals some impatience for progress, but it is an evidence of urgency to achieve reunification um, immediately. I think Xi Jinping has a lot of other problems on his plate, and the existence of Taiwan is not a threat uh, to him to get, getting his third term, which he will get uh, probably a year from now at the 20th Party Congress, um, nor is it a threat to uh, CCP legitimacy. So I'll close by saying I think that um, there is a risk. Uh, the, uh, the United States needs to take actions to strengthen deterrence because we want to make sure that Xi Jinping's own cost-benefit calculus um, recognizes that the costs would be very high. Um, and the U.S. has been doing, I think, uh, many things, including internationalizing the Taiwan issue by encouraging other countries to signal that they have a stake in the preservation of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. What we really need to do is make sure we have a credible capability to defend Taiwan. That's a problem today. It's not a problem that we can actually solve overnight. Um, and in addition, Taiwan must have the wherewithal itself uh, to inflict enormous pain on an invading PLA uh, force. So we have to make sure that Xi Jinping is not tempted to try to take Taiwan by force. And hopefully going forward, uh, China can think more creatively about how to uh, deal with its differences with Taiwan through dialogue um, rather than through coercion. But I don't expect that that's going to happen soon. So the situation is going to remain um, uh, fraught. Um, it remains dangerous. And uh, it is an issue that we must manage, but we cannot solve anytime soon. And thank you so much. I'll turn it back to you, Jerry. Well, that was a great uh, introduction and uh, quite comforting. And I noticed that uh, this week there was a note of caution uh, in the Chinese Communist Party leadership, a reference to the necessity for proceeding carefully in the light of the party's, uh, you might say, fraught history, uh, not to have another catastrophe. And I read that as an important signal that uh, maybe your relative optimism uh, is the correct view. Nevertheless, many people in Taiwan and elsewhere were extremely upset uh, because not long ago, you had this extraordinary incursion of all kinds of military aircraft uh, from Beijing in the immediate areas around Taiwan. And that has raised concerns all over the world that Beijing might think it has to use the time available now before we and our allies pull up our socks because this may be their best opportunity. So I want to hear from Ambassador Young about what should we do if these air uh, incursions in such a massive way occur again? Was our response adequate last time? And if not, what other options do we have? Uh, Steve, what can you tell us? Thank you, Jerry. Um, 
it's good to see all of you and um, from the comfort of my chilly home up in New Hampshire, which probably is the farthest north of all of us. Um, I'm very pleased to, to be here and to uh, join in this conversation. Bonnie really gave a great uh, opening uh, assessment of where we are and I'd like to follow up with that. Um, in particular, I was asked to talk about the US response to the recent barrage of air incursions and so forth and what's up with China. Um, again, uh, uh, Jerry, it's so good to see you uh, uh, and uh, uh, an inspiration to all of us as to how to grow older. <laughs> um, you are a diplomat. I was. Uh, to quote an old uh, Woody Allen line of mine, the once great Woody Allen, we're in a definite kind of situation here. Um, what is needed is a very prudent and measured uh, re response to what's going on. And I think the Biden administration has uh, publicly, call publicly called China out, uh, uh, particularly in his recent phone conversation with Xi Jinping, and was clear about our interests and concerns, both to the American public and to the Chinese leader. Um, US naval passages through the, uh, and near the Taiwan Straits, as well as air and sea forays into the South China Sea are another indication of America's uh, uh, determination to uh, use its own capabilities to warn the Chinese against rash behavior. I think the key here is in shoring up our alliances uh, around the region. And I think that's happening. Uh, I was uh, struck by the uh, accord between the United States, Australia, and uh, the Europeans, the Brits uh, recently, and also the uh, movement by Japan toward, despite its longstanding uh, uh, Pacific, uh, uh, policies, not the ocean, but 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 non non forceful. Japan has been showing greater interest in uh, what's going on in China, and of course we must all remember that it was for fifty years their their colony. Um, China doesn't have many friends. In fact, if you look around Asia, other than Russia, and I think they're a bit, bit of a doubtful partner. Uh, most of the other nations around China and Asia are worried about China's rise and what it means for them, worried about territorial claims and worried in general by Chinese uh, aggressive uh, political and military behavior. Um, meanwhile, um, the United States has been moving air assets into the region in the closer, closer to the bat potential battle zone. And we do have the disadvantage of being a long ways away from Taiwan, though we do have a lot of Asian assets that I think you're all familiar with. I think we could increase our surveillance and reconnaissance flights, for example. And congressional visits to Taiwan are helpful. As, as many of you know, the Congress has long had a special interest in Taiwan and uh, high level visits both to Taiwan and welcoming ta uh, Taiwan's leaders to the United States uh, has become a bipartisan staple in the Congress. We could invoke economic sanctions against China if they continue down uh, this worrisome path, um, but that's a two-edged sword given the incredible inter uh, connection between our two economies. At the same time, Xi Jinping finds himself in a delicate position. He's trying to solidify his goal of a third term and un an unlimited tenure, which I have to believe is controversial behind the scenes. As he pushes this uh, idea of being leader for life, you got to think other senior party associates and partners are wondering if they have to forego any uh, ambition to have the top spot in their lifetime. 
And that's um, in a system with so few guardrails, a, a dangerous position for the top leader to be in. Um, remember, Deng Xiaoping had instituted the two five year term limit, which was uh, uh, abided by for, for the last two leaders. So, so Xi Jinping is trying to change things. That's not me calling you, Jerry. Um, there's democratic pro demographic problems, excuse me, as well. For example, the One China policy has created a disproportion in gender, and young men today are having trouble finding brides. Um, the uh, wealth in inequality, both geographically, north and south, and also between cities and vi villages, between the coast and the interior, is got to be a concern for. Chinese leaders. Now, I'm a Russian historian by education, and I uh, studied the Russian Revolution. And I remember that um, it was uh, a decision by Tsar Nicholas in 1904 to uh, pick a war with Japan that began the, uh, the ultimate uh, collapse of that uh, system 12 years later when. Uh, when the Bolsheviks took over. Uh, so as a historian, I think the Chinese have to be careful about picking conflicts. Um, at the same time, we should not tolerate threats to our friends and neighbors in the region. I think there is a very high likelihood that the United States would get involved quickly and forcefully to any PRC kinetic escalation in or around the Taiwan Strait. There's much at stake, the US credibility in the China and the Asia Pacific, the stability of our friends and neighbors, our global economic prospects. And this would be a war that would likely produce no winners. Uh, and one only hopes that Xi Jinping and his top advisors are prepared to think long and hard over the consequences of any dramatic uh, escalation. So I remain cautiously optimistic that we can work this out. Uh, Xi Jinping is a wild card, but I think he's got lots of other problems at home that uh, would be exacerbated rather than um, ameliorated uh, by picking a quarrel with Taiwan. And it goes without saying, I think, to, to the folks here that Taiwan is not going to be the instigator of any conflict. Thanks very That's, much. That's uh, very helpful, Steve, and it leads to our uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Professor Vincent Wong, because we should start focusing on what's going on in Taiwan. Uh, what has the current government got in mind? And uh, are the people in Taiwan as concerned about what uh, many of us are concerned about the increasing threat from Beijing. Are they at one with the policy of the Thai government of the DPP now? Uh, so Vincent, why don't you give us your view on the Taiwan perspective? Thank you, Jerry, uh, for inviting me to this very important uh, conference. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to serve with such a distinguished panel. Um, I, I will uh, uh, take on your question about uh, what Taiwan has been doing and is likely to do. Uh, since Tsai Ing-wen's election in 2016, um, I think the uh, trilateral relationship among Taiwan, the US and the China have undergone a very uh, important uh, uh, qualitative change. Uh, prior to that, probably uh, beginning with the Li Denghui era, uh, in this triangular relationship, Taiwan was usually the first mover because Taiwan was not satisfied with its status. So thanks to changing national identity and uh, the quest for international uh, respect, uh, cause Taiwanese leaders uh, to uh, make the first move, uh, which is often destabilizing. And then China would in turn uh, make the second move, 
uh, military threats or diplomatic threats. And the United States would then restore the order by trying to return to the status quo by making the third move. However, after 2016, uh, it is China under Xi Jinping uh, that has been making the first move. So the source of um, changing the, the status quo will only come from China. And I agree with uh, Ambassador Yang that the instigator will not come from um, Taiwan. However, Taiwan is not sitting uh, idly by. Uh, President Tsai in her inaugural speech made it very clear Although that she will not go back to the 1992 consensus, she respect uh, the historical fact of the 1992 uh, spirit and so on, the historical uh, facts. So what has uh, Taiwan done in the uh, last few years uh, in light of uh, China's growing assertiveness and uh, aggressiveness? Uh, in a few areas, I would uh, summarize. Of militarily, uh, Taiwan has been engaged in what uh, scholars will call soft balancing. So uh, uh, the Tsai, Tsai government, the DPP government, uh, prior to 2016 uh, was on the other side of the military because the military for a long time had been sort of a, seen as a blue institution closely related to the KMT. But Tsai actually uh, made the defense industry one of the key, five key industries and uh, try to restore the public uh, faith and respect in the military institution. Taiwan is, has also increased its defense spending. The goal is 3% of its GDP. There's still some way to go. So Taiwan is uh, building up its arms and it's also reconsidering its uh, all volunteer uh, system. Taiwan is also externally seeking implicit alliances uh, when Ma ying came to power in 2008, his uh, basic policy was uh, or um, pro-US, peace with China, friendly with Japan. When Tsai came to power, the situation has changed so much. She no longer talk about or uh, peace with China. Instead, she would only say pro-US distance with China from China and then friendly with all other like-minded like, uh, uh, countries. So I think that this is a attempt to uh, seek uh, implicitly uh, alliances. And what is more importantly actually happens uh, in the domestic scene, which most Americans are not aware of. So this is one area I would like to uh, 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 hopefully uh, make some contribution. Well, to start with, uh, since 2016, there has been a significant cooling down of cross-strait exchanges. Let me give you a few indicators. During the eight years of the Ma uh, administration, uh, cross-strait relations uh, were uh, uh, entered into an era of rapprochement. In eight years, the two sides of the Taiwan Strait signed 21 cross-strait agreements. These cover all areas of functional and some, I would say, uh, low politics uh, area. Of course, the crowning moment was the uh, economic uh, framework of eco uh, ECFA, Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement. And of course, this hit a wall in 2014 with the sun, uh, Sunflower Movement uh, over the dispute of cross-strait service trade agreement. So that's 21 agreements, uh, and then two were still held up in the legislative yuan. Taiwan's legislature. From 2016 to the present, namely the DPP era, uh, do you want to take a guess of how many cross, new cross-strait agreements have been signed? Zero. So that, of course, uh, the basic re reason is that the, the China's uh, semi-official exchange agency uh, call off uh, any kind of talk with Taiwan, but I think the still numbers show that cross-strait uh, exchanges have cooled down considerably. Secondly, Taiwan had uh, enacted in some legal moves to, uh, I, I will call them, uh, counter the, uh, the so-called uh, sharp power. The National uh, Endowment for Democracy around 2017 coined the phrase of sharp power 
to de denote the tendency and the capability of authoritarian states such as China and Russia to take advantage of the vulnerability exhibited by open societies such as Taiwan, uh, the US and other U European countries. So what happened is that Taiwan in 2019 uh, with very little uh, uh, resistance in its legislature passed uh, the amendments of five national security laws. These are very low profile, but I think that uh, you know, of, of many people might be concerned that this will be a, uh, a retrograde of uh, Taiwan's legal development. But in fact, I think it's actually a very important uh, plug in the hole of uh, China's exercise of sharp power in Taiwan. So for example, uh, Taiwan's original, in Taiwan's constitution, uh, uh, the Republic of China regards the mainland Hong Kong and Macau as part of its territory constitutionally. Therefore, uh, acts of treason committed by its citizens in, uh, on those territories are not criminal. So Taiwan's criminal law now made it possible to prosecute those people who have committed acts of treason on uh, mainland China, Hong Kong, and Macau as if they were treason against Taiwan. So that's just one example. And there are other um, uh, legal changes such as national security law uh, and national secret uh, protection law had lengthened the number of years uh, retired uh, officials must be under uh, Exit, uh, exit control, or uh, that uh, Taiwanese citizens, if they are un, uh, working on behalf of mainland organizations, are subject to criminal prosecution uh, and so on. So some of the moves are very, uh, very much like uh, the US are trying to uh, make the uh, PRC entities as foreign agents. And finally, there was restriction on retired generals to participate in some PRC activities that are seen as glorifying the PRC state symbols and so on. Uh, the, the, the punishment is that they, uh, their pension will be stripped. So Taiwan took legal measures to strengthen its, uh, its open society uh, at a minimal cost to uh, the damage to uh, human rights. And thirdly, uh, I would argue during this period of time, this society has a uh, general public opinion toward the PRC has turned decisively negative. The turning point, of course, was uh, Xi Jinping's very he heavy handed handling of Hong Kong, because for a long time, uh, people in Taiwan pay a lot of attention to what's going on in Hong Kong. But then the crackdown in Hong Kong really uh, made, made it very clear to Taiwanese people that China cannot be trusted. And also the, uh, uh, the, a lot of the increased incursion of PRC uh, flight planes into uh, ROC's ADIZ, as Ambassador Yang mentioned, uh, even though Taiwanese people uh, are aware of this, they, that doesn't mean that they like it uh, uh, either. In fact, the Ministry of National Defense actually published, publicized such incursions on a daily basis. So people actually are aware of this. And in fact, uh, I can cite one example of the, the poll done by the uh, Mainland Affairs uh, Council. So one question asked, uh, in recent days, the Chinese military plane and the uh, military vessels uh, have circum circumvented uh, the areas around Taiwan and uh, uh, in order to uh, militarily in intimidate Taiwan. Do you agree or not agree with the PRC's move? And 90% of, I mean, the, the question is a little leading, but I think it still gives you a, a sense of uh, uh, the sentiment. 90% say they don't agree. And then also say that the PRC uh, proposed one country, two system for Taiwan and uh, see Taiwan as the same as, uh, uh, it is basically a local government and uh, will be under the Chinese rule. The Republic of China will no longer, no longer exist. Uh, do you agree or not agree uh, China's proposal? And 89% say disagree. So I think the public attitude has really decisively turned negative against uh, China. 
And one last thing that uh, the DPP government has done, which is a little bit controversial, is that uh, they uh, are trying to um, tackle uh, sometimes uh, news that is not favorable to the government uh, as uh, attempts by China to wage so the so-called cognitive, cognitive war, 认知战, uh, for in fact that the Taiwan's uh, uh, public has very partisan uh, awareness of many things. What is uh, Taiwan likely to do in the future, in the near future? Um, I think that um, in next year, there will be a, a so-called midterm election. And in 2024, there will be a general election. It is very um, certain that the political landscape in Taiwan, when it comes to cross-street relations, has actually narrowed as a result of the trends I mentioned earlier. In other words, the kind of KMT that used to uh, deliver on uh, 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 moderate uh, cross trade relations to win the popular support in Taiwan is gone. So even the KMT will become a quote unquote centrist party when it comes to the issue of cross trade relations. And then of course, in other words, the KMT will move toward the DPP and any politician that talk about 1992 consensus uh, probably or, uh, be, uh, will not win the election because Xi Jinping has flatly uh, rejected or negated the possibility of each side has its own interpretation. I think uh, lastly, that Taiwan is unlikely to instigate any change because the current dynamics that China making the first change and the US elevate its relationship uh, explicitly or implicit with Taiwan is quite in the interest of Taiwan. So we will see that Taiwan and the United States in the years ahead to work very closely together. I think I should stop here. That was a terrific articulate statement, Vincent. And it now leads us directly to Tess Bridgman because we can't assume that the United States uh, executive branch is free to do whatever it wants toward Taiwan. Uh, we have domestic legal constraints on the exercise of military and other power. And we have international law restraints. And Tess Bridgman uh, is in a good position to give us some light on that. So Tess, we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much, Jerry, and, and thanks for inviting me to participate in this fabulous panel. Uh, it certainly does raise a host of really uh, tricky legal questions. Uh, I would echo on the legal side what our, our first panelist, Bonnie, was saying with respect to the overall dynamic. It's fraught and it's dangerous. Um, and that's something that uh, I think will be made clear on both the domestic and the international legal issues that, that this uh, rises. So um, I, was, I was asked to, to think mainly about um, the situation in which we're actually uh, contemplating the use of force in defense of Taiwan, I'll just kind of bracket that there could be a lot of situations short of force where other really interesting legal questions arise, but focusing squarely on what happens if there is uh, an invasion by the mainland and attempt to, to take uh, the island of Taiwan by force. Um, the first question that any executive branch lawyer would look at, and I, I'll uh, kind of go through this with my former executive branch lawyer hat on, having practiced at the State Department and, and at the White House. Uh, the first question, of course, is has Congress authorized a use of military force? And here the answer is, is clearly no. There was, uh, in 1955, enacted a, an authorization for the use of force to defend Formosa, which is what we then, of course, called Taiwan, uh, repealed about 20 years later. Um, but there is one statute on point that is highly relevant to this whole conversation, the Taiwan Relations Act, um, which Congress passed after the U.S. cut ties with Taiwan, you know, abrogated the, the U.S. Uh, ROC Mutual Defense Treaty and established relations with mainland China. Uh, but Congress passed this really remarkable statute that in many ways actually creates some of the trappings of sovereignty for Taiwan in statute, applying U.S. laws to Taiwan in, in some of the same ways that they would apply to sovereigns, et cetera. Um, and it speaks directly to this question of how the U.S. should respond to a threat to Taiwan. 
Uh, and the, the language in the TRA is the president is directed to inform the Congress promptly of any threat to the security or the social or economic system of the people on Taiwan and any danger to the interests of the United States arising therefrom. And here's the key language. The president and the Congress shall determine in accordance with constitutional processes, appropriate action by the United States in response to any such danger. So what does that mean? Arguably, it means the president is not free to act unilaterally. Uh, what the president is to do is to inform Congress promptly if there's a, a threat to Taiwan, and then consult with Congress about what next steps should be taken, recognizing that it's Congress under Article One of the Constitution that's granted the power to declare war, to, to bring the U.S. To, into conflict, uh, and it's, it's the president who is the commander in chief who would then implement that authorization for the most part. Uh, so strictly speaking, all there is really is an obligation to consult with Congress, uh, but we can probably read it as Congress saying the president is uh, is not to act unilaterally. Uh, there is debate on that point, and we can, we can bracket that for now in the interest of time. Uh, so one thing the president could do, of course, is ask Congress for an AUMF. Uh, an authorization for the use of military force. Uh, there is uh, considerable debate about the, the wisdom of that uh, from a policy perspective, which I'm also happy to get into later, um, time permitting in the Q&A. Uh, but short of Congress authorizing force, which uh, it, it may or may not do when push comes to shove, despite Congress having uh, historically been sort of more in the, in the hawkish campaign in terms of defense of Taiwan, um, members aren't terribly keen to go on record taking votes to, to bring us into a, a great military conflagration. Um, and the president may or may not want to even put members of Congress in that position. Uh, if, if he wants to argue that he has a free hand to use force, he may not want to run the risk that Congress does not provide an AUMF if, if he asks for one. Uh, so does the president have unilateral authority under the Constitution to take the US to war in defense of Taiwan against mainland China? And the, the way the executive branch has looked at this question of unilateral presidential authority to use force uh, has in, in recent history boiled down to a two-part test. So first, uh, the use of force would have to serve an important national interest. Uh, and second, it, it can't rise to the level of what uh, the Department of Justice calls war in the constitutional sense. Um, and that's essentially uh, legalese for a war that looks like a traditional shooting war, uh, looks like something that's likely to lead to you know, casualties on the US side, uh, has a risk of escalating into a, a large conflagration and doesn't look like one of these low intensity one-off strikes that the US has been engaging in in the counterterrorism context for some decades now. Um, so to take each of those in turn, the national interest prong of that equation, it historically was tethered to things like rescue of US nationals abroad. It's, it's really quite broad now. It's been found to exist, for example, in a national interest in engaging in humanitarian interventions, in uh, you know, responding to uh, Assad's use of chemical weapons in Syria. I personally think the US would have very little trouble um, saying that bar is met in this case and in the case of defense of Taiwan. Uh, that said, there is definitely a, a reasonable argument to be made uh, that the faithful application of that national interest test looks to whether Congress has in fact recognized that interest. Now, Congress has absolutely recognized an interest in uh, it, you know, uh, protecting and defending Taiwan, but in the context of uh, an overall peaceful settlement of the dispute, as well as in the context um, of, of a joint decision-making model, which, which in which the president consults with Congress before deciding what action to take if Taiwan is under threat. Uh, so there is some question around that prong, but assuming that, that that's met, that, uh, that the executive branch decided there is a sufficiently important national interest, the next question is whether the use of force would amount to war in the constitutional sense. Uh, and the Department of Justice says that that's based on the anticipated nature, scope, and duration of, of the activities at issue. It's a highly fact-specific inquiry. Uh, and it'll look to things like, is there a, a big risk of escalation? Is there a high risk to US forces, to other, other US interests? Um, typically, when a when a uh, use of force would be against another state, uh, that weighs in favor of allowing Congress to weigh in um, and saying that 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 is in fact reserved to Congress uh, to decide. Although that's not always been the case. Um, 
So uh, I, I think that the real question here is what kind of hostilities are we looking at? And in the case of any sort of full scale invasion uh, by the mainland, uh, it would be hard to argue that a U.S. response wouldn't constitute war in the constitutional sense, which again means Congress has to weigh in and the president can't just unilaterally take the U.S. to war in, in Taiwan's defense. Um, but what about a, a lower intensity type of conflagration? What about cyber attacks that arguably rise to the level of use of force, but we're not seeing this kind of kinetic uh, use of force that uh, DOJ is usually looking at in these questions. I think there's there's a real set of issues around that kind of lower intensity conflict and whether uh, whether it could be cabined, whether that risk of escalation uh, is just too great. Um, but that would be a question that uh, that the executive branch would be looking to there. So. Uh, the, the kind of footnote on the domestic law question is just that if the president did decide he had unilater unilateral authority to act, uh, and if Congress did not in fact authorize it, then the war powers resolution uh, kicks in, which has a 60 day limit essentially uh, on unilateral presidential uses of force that are not authorized by Congress. Uh, and after 60 days, that use of force would have to be terminated unless it is authorized by Congress in that period. Um, so that's just another kind of footnote to keep in the background uh, on this question. International law, uh, it, it's arguably even more fraught. Uh, if the domestic law side wasn't clear as mud, the international law side uh, will, will really make your head spin. So uh, as everyone knows, the UN Charter prohibits the use of force against the sovereignty or territorial integrity of other states. It also allows for a right of self-defense, but that right, of course, is invoked by states, not by non-state entities. So the, UN, the US uh, position currently, right, not recognizing Taiwan as a sovereign state uh, would also seem to preclude the US under international law from coming to Taiwan's defense if attacked by the mainland, uh, right? So the US uh, officially does not formally recognize Chinese sovereignty over Taiwan, but uh, acknowledging uh, the one China policy uh, and uh, you know, in the 1982 joint communique with China, uh, the US stating it has no intention of infringing on Chinese sovereignty and territorial integrity, for example. These assurances are non-binding, uh, but nevertheless reflect the US legal positions on, on the, the status of Taiwan. Uh, so if Taiwan is not recognized as a state and is, of course, no longer claiming to be the, the, the lawful government for all of China, uh, as, as was the case many decades ago, uh, the mainland resort to force would not itself under international law be unlawful, but a U.S. intervention to stop it would be. Um, and this is what uh, Julian Ku has called international law bizarro world in terms of the US posture, uh, that if Taiwan declares independence, the US has, has sometimes signaled that it would then not consider itself uh, bound in any way to defend Taiwan against a Chinese invasion. Although in theory, in that case, doing so would be lawful if Taiwan were in fact an independent state invoking self-defense. Uh, and on the flip side, if Taiwan keeps the status quo, and does not declare independence that the US is more likely to come to its aid uh, if, if invaded. Uh, even though in that case, right, we're, we're looking more at a situation where China would be using force within what's purported to be its own territory uh, to put down essentially uh, what would be categorized as secessionists. That's what uh, Russia is doing in, in Ukraine, for example, is coming to the aid of secessionists. And we, we call it unlawful when it happens there. Uh, so what's an international lawyer to do with this? What, what would the State Department and the White House and, and the Department of Defense be, be thinking through? Uh, one is, is the question of sort of a, a quick post hoc recognition if you're in a situation where use of force really becomes necessary. Uh, that's sort of an ugly set of questions to face. And I think it would probably be dressed up in a lot of political language around legitimacy as well. But uh, it's something that if push came to shove could be on the table. Uh, a second issue to keep in mind is that there's arguably, and in, in US practice, there has been um, a right of self-defense limited to the rescue of nationals in peril. Uh, and to the extent the U.S. has U.S. personnel in Taiwan uh, or 
a large number of U.S. nationals resident there, uh, you could you could arguably see the U.S. arguing that it's lawful as an international law matter at least to act to protect those U.S. nationals uh, and personnel, although that would be a more limited set of operations that arguably wouldn't do much for the actual defense of Taiwan. Um, so there's a, a really, uh, you know, fraught and, and complex set of issues around the policy that is optimal for arguably achieving de-escalation and avoiding conflict is not a policy that maps well onto the international legal frameworks that we're operating under. Um, the the hope of course is that push never comes to shove and that these difficult questions about do you do you do a quick recognition uh do you make political arguments and not try to make arguments sounding in international law uh those are questions that executive branch lawyers don't want to find themselves facing uh but if push came to shove i think those those kinds of arguments that we've been uh teasing out are the ones that would be on the table uh for the us to try to make i will in the interest of time stop there Terrific presentation, and we could devote the next two hours to exploring that. And of course, you've given us an admirable presentation of what executive branch lawyers think. But of course, Congress has its own lawyers, and sometimes these issues even get to the Supreme Court. But I'm sure I'm not the only one thinking as I listen to your recitation. What does this mean for the need for a quick response to any serious use of military force by Beijing against Taiwan? But uh, I think we're going to turn to questions and uh, I hope there will be some, but first we ought to hear, as they say, uh, a word from our sponsor. Uh, in this case, we mean the continuing legal education program which has a code number for us. So I'm going to share um, the code on the screen. The course code for those of you who are interested in receiving CLE credit is NYU2211. I'll read it again, NYU2211. Thank you. That seems almost disappointing in its simplicity. But uh, let's now go on to the, do we have some questions? Uh, Catherine, are you in charge of that? Yeah, I'd just like to also say, Jerry, we'll only have um, Bonnie Glazer with us for another six minutes now. So <laughs> I would say, let's please prioritize questions for Bonnie first, or give her the first crack at answering any of them, because unfortunately she does have to leave us a little bit early. Um, so um, the first question I'll take from the queue, and I'd encourage everybody else to, um, to bring us your questions, um, is a very simple one. Um, the question is, I'm not sure I can visualize the United States fighting a war over Taiwan. I know we've been arming Taiwan, but I wonder if it has enough military strength to ward off China. So, I mean, this kind of, I actually see two questions there is, can we visualize, can any of us actually visualize the US going to war over Taiwan? And I know, of course, um, uh, Dean Wong did discuss a bit the military capacities of Taiwan. Um, what are its actual capacities if it really came to something? And um, yeah, and I think we should throw this first to to Bonnie to have a have something to say on that. Well, thank you, and I, I apologize uh, in advance that I have to leave early. Um, I can envision the United States going to war over Taiwan, although I hope we never see that day. Um, uh, it is really quite difficult for a military to uh, transport a large number of of troops and weapons. Uh, 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 what is uh, basically about uh, 100 miles across a body of water. Uh, Taiwan is primarily mountainous. There are very few beaches that uh, military forces could land on. Um, and uh, Taiwan doesn't have to have the same set of military capabilities that China has. It needs a different set to deter um, and defeat an, an invasion. So it needs things like smart sea mines, um, uh, it has recently acquired uh, coastal defense cruise missiles and things like Stinger missiles that they can fire at invading forces. Uh, if 
a, a large number of, uh, of PLA troops were to land on Taiwan, then there's the big question as to whether the rest of the, of the people, the civilians would fight the reservists. Uh, Taiwan doesn't have a very strong reserve uh, and uh, they're working on that, but uh, that, that will probably take years to fix. It doesn't have a sort of civilian territorial defense force, which uh, like Sweden and Finland and uh, Lithuania uh, uh, really do have uh, considerable capabilities where their population can actually um, get involved in ways of defending local communities. So uh, some people said Taiwan should learn from Israel if, if they do, they really have a long way to go. Uh, but the real the real key is is to acquire what what we, we use the phrase asymmetric uh, capabilities. And uh, I remember a friend of mine used to work at the Defense Department used to say Taiwan should buy small numbers of large things and large numbers of small things. Um, and so they don't need a lot of uh, very heavy tanks, which they have bought from the United States or large numbers of fighter jets that are not going to survive um, the opening salvos of a war, but they need um, asymmetric weapons that they can use to attack an invading PLA force. Uh, so it's a work in progress. Would others uh, on the panel like to comment on that as well? Dean Wong? Um, I think um, that um, it's hard to imagine that Taiwan would be uh, the instigator of the attack against China in a military, uh, imagine the military conflict. Uh, it's the other way around. So I think the, the real question is uh, whether Taiwan has uh, the ability to impose unbearable costs for China. So the invasion of Taiwan is not only a military question, but also a political question. I think the one of the questions is, uh, you know, what is what does Taiwan mean for Xi Jinping? Is this a legacy question and so on? So if the uh, political calculation uh, is such for China that the cost is too high, maybe they will think twice. And I agree with uh, Bonnie's analysis just now that you know that Taiwan has an advantage in defense, and that the uh, you know the asymmetric capabilities should be emphasized. But at the same time, I would argue that those large assets still serve very important uh, political purposes. Although, um, yeah, I mean, you, you, in the opening salvo, probably they're all gone. But I think that. Uh, uh, that is actually a, a very concrete symbol of the U.S. Uh, security uh, guarantee, and I mean, currently a commitment to Taiwan. Some experts point out, of course, that China's limited military record uh, since the Korean War is not impressive. It wasn't impressive in dealing with India, and it hasn't been impressive in dealing with Vietnam. So. Undoubtedly, there have been major improvements, but one has to retain some question about that. But we may only be talking about three days, four days, a week perhaps. If the United States is likely to be involved, that is the real deterrent for Xi Jinping. That makes, I think, the calculation, if we pull up our socks in the period we have ahead of us, uh, that makes it too costly for a cautious leader. Yeah, one of the other questions in the queue, well, there are several that are asking about the military angle. One of them asks about the role of the Australian military and the Japanese. Now, the, the question isn't really clear about what the scenario would be in which they would become involved, but is there a vision that other uh, like-minded nations would also be coming, uh, so to speak, to the rescue uh, or um, short of a full invasion be taking some kind of military action that would also present a warning. Bonnie? I will jump in and then I'm afraid I have to leave and I am so sorry. Uh, but uh, I think that increasingly we have heard over the last uh, six months or so statements by senior Japanese officials uh, signaling that they have a very strong stake in the preservation of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. 
Uh, but um, these are legal questions. I'm not a lawyer, uh, but Japan has um, a constitution. Um, I am confident that they would allow the United States to use their bases and their hospitals um, probably would provide logistics support, but I don't think the Japanese are going to be fighting at the front lines. Though recently we did hear um, uh, their um, uh, vice um, premier uh, talk about how this could be an issue that uh, could, could be connected to the survival of Japan. And hopefully Tess can explain to everybody why that language is in fact very, very important. Uh, but we have had debates in Japan about whether or not uh, Japan could use uh, their military force under any circumstance other than to defend Japan directly. So if China is not actually attacking Japan, but if it's attacking the United States um, or threatening uh, uh, Taiwan, um, unless it is an issue of survivability uh, for, for Japan, then I think um, uh, uh, then it becomes legally difficult for uh, for Japan to do that. But I will throw that part of it over to Tess. But I would just say that the Australians also, two days ago, um, Australia's defense minister, Peter Dutton, said that uh, the, uh, the Australian uh, uh, army would be likely uh, to get involved if the United States went to war to defend Taiwan. The Australians have fought alongside the United States in every war since World War I, I believe. So um, I wouldn't be surprised. But in my view, the most important um, uh, value of these statements is that they are coming in peacetime. That, uh, as, as, as Jerry said, they will, they will help Xi Jinping recognize that he would pay a very high price uh, if he actually did use force against Taiwan. So uh, these are important um, elements of, uh, of strengthening deterrence. And if I've said anything wrong, Jerry or Tess will correct me. So Bye. thank you again. Thanks for coming, Bonnie. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah. Uh, Steve, do you want to pitch in here? Yeah, well, uh... I must admit I'm emotionally involved in this. I lived in Taiwan five times, including as a boy. My father was a, a military advisor to the Taiwan um, uh, army back in the early 60s. And that was the first of five times visiting and living in Taiwan over the last 50 years. So I think um, there's a lot going on here. Very interesting, and 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 a couple of the speakers just touched on it. Is is a much more robust um, attitude in Tokyo toward the stability of Taiwan and the role of the Japanese. There's always been the question of whether they would support American uh, deployments through Japan, uh, but uh, this is it seems to be going even further than that, and of course. The fact that China, the mainland, is still trying to litigate the Second World War with Japan uh, has made that country very unpopular with many Japanese here how many years later. Um, there's also the vulnerability of Japanese territories that China claims uh, north of, of Taiwan. So. Um, that plus, as has been mentioned, the Australian uh, uh, moves recently should give Mr. Xi even greater uh, cause for, for caution before he launches something that could end his ambition to be president for life, as well as uh, a lot of other things. Good. Any other comment, Vincent, you want to try? I just, uh, just to follow up on the, uh, the symbolism of uh, Japan and Australia and other countries uh, adding support to the US. Uh, Secretary of, uh, of State Tony Blinken uh, said the other day that if the Chinese are going to use force against Taiwan, uh, there will be, I mean, it's just not just, it's, it's not just the United States, it's other countries will be together. So this strategy of seeking partnership, although we, we do not, uh, we cannot uh, 
expect Japan to be involved in direct comeback, uh, thanks to those constitutional issues, but they can provide base support, logistical support. And it's also very likely that uh, uh, if the military conflict escalate, the Chinese will actually attack the US bases located on Japan. So that will, Japan will have you know, the, the legitimate reasons for getting involved. Australia might play a very important role in another scenario, which is uh, if China should uh, impose naval quarantine uh, or blockade against Taiwan. In that regard, the recent uh, AUKUS deal is especially important. Another question, Catherine? Sorry, I think uh, Tess, you look like you wanted to say something. So please. Just going to chime in briefly to uh, the issue that Bonnie threw in my direction. Um, and I'll comment uh, really only on the international law side of the equation because I'm not a Japanese constitutional law expert, although my understanding of the issue is that they have reinterpreted their constitution to allow for some uses of, of force in, in collective self-defense so long as Japan itself is threatened. And I think that's that's the import of the words that she read, but uh, they would have of course faced the same international law problem as I described with the United States. Uh, that is, unless the sovereignty of Taiwan is recognized, which of course we, we do not right now, uh, the uh, the defense of Taiwan as a collective self-defense matter uh, would itself be unlawful. Um, there is a question whether states that are closer to Taiwan in the region could make an argument that it is in fact their own self-defense and not uh, defense of Taiwan. I think in Japan's case, that is likely still a, a pretty difficult argument to make. Um, but the 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 real issue I think underlying a lot of this then is what kind of diplomatic coalition will you see and will that coalition be able to form fast enough? My my sense is that the way thing, these things develop in real time, those legal questions will actually be answered after the resolution of, of the political issue of uh, are these states willing to use force? Uh, are they willing to go in together? Would, would any of these states do it alone? Would the US do it alone? Um, but they're still going to have to answer those questions at the end of the day. Uh, and no one wants to say uh, it was illegal, but we had to do it. You'd rather have something that you can, you can say with a straight face. So uh, that question of recognition will become I think an important one as much, you know, at, in, in an uh, after a use of force scenario as it is uh, prior when there's still a, a benefit to that ambiguity and trying to de-escalate and trying to avoid uh, getting to that use of force uh, posture in, in the first place. Uh, so just wanted to flag that that wrinkle exists for other states and it's it's another reason to uh, to look at, at how closely synced are, are the diplomatic efforts of, of those who are like-minded on this set of issues. We have time for one more question, Catherine. Yeah. So uh, the question is uh, that Tess has made a fine presentation about the US national interest in the Taiwan situation, which is 10,000 miles away. Has the panel considered the national interest that China sees in Taiwan to be reunified with the mainland and all of the resolve going along with it? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm reading a little bit into this question, but what I'm seeing is, is uh, an implicit uh, comparison of national, the strength of national interests and therefore the strength of resolve uh, if it came to a contest between the US and China over Taiwan, presumably China's interest and resolve would be greater. Who would like to take that one on? I would add, of course, our recent experience in the Near East uh, will not encourage many people to think we should take on the commitment to defend Taiwan in the crisis. And that's the educational point. I think that many of us who want to defend Taiwan have to confront. Steve? Well, uh... I think uh, it's a very good and a tough question, but um, I guess I'd start by saying uh, U.S. credibility in uh, the Far East would be perhaps irreparably damaged if we stood idly by in the face of naked aggression by China against Taiwan. Um, and there's a lot at stake there. Um, 
I think for China as well, there's a tremendous amount at, at stake. There's the question of uh, A, would they succeed? B, at what cost? And C, um, how long might that take? Uh, and I'm one of those people who believes that autocratic or, or authoritarian regimes like the Chinese one are very brittle in such circ circumstances. So I think uh, despite the uh, longstanding propaganda about Taiwan, uh, leaders there would have to be very, very carefully um, uh, cautious before they commit to something that could not only fail, but bring down the current regime. And since Xi Jinping has uh, made it clear he wants to be emperor, excuse me, uh, president for life, um, he has a vested interest in being uh, cautious here. Uh, you know, there's an awful lot of talk about the capabilities of, of China versus Taiwan, and, and I don't think this is the time to go further into that. Uh, and also the, the willingness of the people of Taiwan to fight. But I, I do think from my longtime experience in Taiwan that uh, it would be a highly risky uh, throw of the dice on China's part to launch an unprovoked invasion. And I would add that there will never be a provocation that the rest of the world would accept for that to be justified. On time what about the cost, Steve, of maintaining security if they did get initial control over Taiwan? Would the Taiwan people put up much continuing resistance? Or would it be like the situation in Hong Kong, the minute that the national security regime came in, the opposition has faded, even though it was amazingly violent uh, in 2019. And look at the situation in Crimea. What, maybe Vincent could address this. What could we expect from a Taiwan population that was forced to go under Beijing's control? I think, uh, as Bonnie mentioned earlier, uh, in this aspect, it is still a work in progress. I think that Taiwan, uh, uh, the current situation is like a, a glass of water, half full and half uh, empty. The critics might say that uh, they have no confidence in Taiwan's will to resist, particularly after the Chinese have made the initial landing. But Taiwan's, um, until recently, every uh, able-bodied man has actually served in the military. You know, we can actually argue, you know, how effective it is. And there are regular recalls, so they'll go back to, uh, uh, to, to, to train and so on. And Taiwan has a lot of places where a guerrilla warfare is actually possible. And uh, Taiwan has more motorcycles than uh, cars, and motorcycles are very mobile. So I, I wouldn't underestimate, uh, if there's political will, uh, I wouldn't underestimate uh, the Taiwanese uh, will to resist. Um, can I join in there? Um, in my many uh, travels around Taiwan over the years, I learned of some uh, clear and serious challenges to Japanese rule mounted by uh, uh, Taiwan forces after the uh, annexation of or, or occupation of, of Taiwan in 1895. Um, not successful, but um, I, I think uh, uh, building on what Vincent has suggested uh, that, uh, uh, and I hope this never comes to pass, I hope we can manage to maintain the peace and that <clears throat> optimally the Chinese will become a more open society with a little bit different view about these things. But uh, if the Chinese were to try and invade, and if they got uh, a foothold on the mainland, on, on the, the, the shores of Taiwan, which is another big question, I don't think it would end there. 
Um, so, um, you know, I think Xi Jinping has to be very careful that he's got plenty of other problems. And uh, if he really wants to remain in power for a long time to come, adventurism in Taiwan doesn't seem in my perspective to play positively in that, in that goal. Maybe that's a good basis for concluding what's been a remarkably interesting and valuable program. Up to you, Catherine. Well, I would just like to thank everybody so much. Uh, first of all, thank you, Jerry, and all of the panelists for your excellent contributions to this discussion. And thank you to the audience as well for joining us this evening. Uh, good night.